All right, guys. So I have, I have kind of a fun presentation for you today. It's going to be a little bit interactive. Uh, it's going to be uh, based on a topic and a trend um, that is popular and well known here in Poland and particularly Eastern Europe and, and, and generally um, across the EU, which is uh, medical tourism. So we're going to be talking about a couple of different topics. And uh, what I've done is I've, uh, it's going to be an act uh, of three parts. And let me kind of show you what the three parts are going to be. First, I'm going to um, discuss a little bit about the center and myself. That's not part of the, the whole show. And then the three parts are we're going to talk a little bit about what medical tourism is. And I'm going to give you some stories uh, from the front lines of medical tourism. And these are really some fascinating stories because these are free market health care at its most raw. And so uh, some of these stories um, may not be to your liking, uh, just to tell you in advance, uh, because you may say, wow, that's not good, or that is that is really terrific, or wonderful, or it makes me sad. But these are free market stories, and so it, it will give you a true sense of what's going on in healthcare, particularly in uh, the area of uh, raw free markets and um, how they interact with uh, the business of health. Then I have some lessons for libertarians when it comes to debating or talking to particularly progressives about or socialists about health care. Um, it's, it's an issue. Um, many libertarians uh, fear to tread in that direction because um, the, they're afraid that they're going to get the feels and um, the feels are going to be everyone should have health care because everyone deserves to have health care. And, and it's very difficult to debate that, but I'm going to give you some tools and some lessons from uh, health care and health care uh, uh, economic data that will help you to understand um, some reason, rationality, and logic when it comes to that. And then we're going to talk uh, specifically about a study which I uh, prepared uh, for this conference, uh, which, as far as I know, hasn't been uh, completely performed um, uh, this way, which is to compare some of the economies of Eastern Europe, uh, particularly Poland, uh, with the Western European countries and to try to determine what differences there are in terms of medical tourism intensity, for lack of a better term. It's pretty fascinating because there, there does appear to be some differences, and I want to show you what, what I found. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, so first of all, let me tell you a little bit about my Center for Medical Tourism Research. I'm the founder and the director. I've been at it for, uh, I think, a little over a decade now. And uh, what it is is it's an academic-based research center. So we are not really interested in making a lot of money. What we're interested in is telling the truth, which is uh, fantastic because there's not a lot of truth tellers in this area. Um, it's a very uh, wild, wild west right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, 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 stakeholders out there that are selling snake oil. There's a lot of people that are uninformed. There's a lot of people that are fly-by-night experts. And uh, what they are not typically doing is bringing you truth based um, on empirical evidence, based on logical, rational, reasoned analysis of uh, the circumstances and the situation. So um, that's what we're trying to do is trying to help with this uh, really incredible, wonderful, uh, neat trend that's going on. But but speak the truth as much as possible. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm part of a, um, a private Catholic University out of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, as I've told several of you, it's the uh, third largest uh, private school in Texas. Uh, we, we have uh, the business school is the largest school, but we also have a medical school. We also have a uh, PT school, pharmacy school, optometry school, variety of areas, uh, nursing program, education program, all the things you would expect. I um, think uh, 11,000 students now, something like that. Supposedly in the next uh, couple of years, we're potentially going to catch up with uh, a school some of you might have heard of, which is Texas Christian University. And then that would put us as the second largest private school behind Baylor. Uh, scarily enough in Texas. Um, so um, the, my background and uh, the people that have worked in the center and, and advised me in the center typically are people that have extensive health care and also international business background. So we, uh, we come with actual uh, industry experience and not just the academic uh, theoretical experience. Um, so did I, oh, um, 
Yeah, there we go. Let's, I'm sorry, I'll go back and forth. I was going to tell you about me, and then we'll talk about uh, medical tourism. So uh, a little bit about me. Again, I, I have a, a lot of uh, applied experience. I worked with the uh, largest publicly traded uh, hospital company in the world, which is HCA. I rose to the level of vice president with them uh, for a multi-billion dollar subsidiary of a multi-billion dollar um, publicly traded firm. We were actually the largest group, uh, single site group of facilities uh, within HCA. And um, uh, since then, um, the uh, prior to that, sorry, I was a consultant with Ernst Young, but since then I'm uh, working with um, uh, medical tourism uh, stakeholders and companies and countries around the world. I've done work uh, with uh, the UN, I've done work with uh, several medical tourism countries, usually governmental entities that represent the uh, medical tourism interest of that company, uh, country, excuse me. Um, also uh, done a lot of speeches, uh, quite a number of books, chapters, papers, stuff like that. Just type me up on, uh, on Google and you'll find uh, some good and bad stuff about me. Uh, so just to kind of mess up. Uh, I've uh, advised uh, the several uh, political campaigns, uh, but only one libertarian so far, which is very surprising to me. I've been wanting to get more involved in that because um, medical tourism, particularly free market aspects of healthcare, are really a hot topic because there's uh, substantial opportunities for savings. And I'm going to show you one of those models here in just a little bit. And I've actually worked uh, with some of the largest healthcare companies in the world um, helping them with um, different models that uh, they can use. All right, so promised I'd go back. Okay, so let's talk about medical tourism in a, a kind of a theoretical model. And this is how it, it appears in my very simple mind. I'm, I'm a simple man, and this is the simple model I came up with, which is um, essentially technology has brought about um, a lot of the globalization that we see. If it wasn't for, for example, uh, the internet and the ability of communication medias uh, to, um, to pass along information, for example, the John Hopkins protocols wouldn't be available for other hospitals around the world. They are, they're utilized, and the reason for that is technology. So technology has basically enabled globalization. Globalization has allowed for more choices um, and again, you think about uh, if you're, if I asked everybody in the audience to, um, and again, it doesn't work as well when I'm in Europe because most of your clothes are Turkish, but um, uh, if I, when I'm in the U.S., I tell my students, um, all right, I got a challenge for you. You have to take off all your clothes that are not made in the United States. And most of the students go, really? My clothes aren't? Uh, and I go, yes. So pretty much all of you are going to be naked by the end of the class because <laughs> most of your textiles are made in Mexico. They're made in uh, Indonesia. They're made in a variety of other places, but they're not made in the United States. In fact, the last major textile apparel producer in the United States, anybody remember? It just went bankrupt. American Apparel. It was actually named American Apparel, yeah, and they just went into bankruptcy. Anyway, so the globalization has allowed for and continues to allow for a great deal of consumerization. In other words, the, the people's ability to choose among products. So for example, when you go into a liquor store now in the United States or in Poland, you can pick up a French wine. If you, uh, if you go into a store, you can pick up a Swiss chocolate. If you go into a car dealership, you can pick up a Japanese or a German vehicle. And all of those are readily available around the world because of globalization. So um, allows for consumerism. Consumerism ultimately leads to, in healthcare, leads to choice. It leads to alternatives, which leads to medical tourism, including international alternatives, uh, domestic and international. We'll, we'll talk about both. All right, so I think this is the coolest free market trend in the world. I'm hoping to convince you, and uh, I got some um, some good stuff here that will help me tell the story. That's open help convince you. So I've got a little bit of boring stuff and then we'll get to the really fun stuff. All right, so the boring stuff. So basic definition. My basic definition of medical tourism is fairly broad because what I've seen is a variety of health-seeking behaviors that fall within the boundaries of some type of medical tourism. So I'm basically saying it's health-seeking behaviors that typically occur outside of a local region. I know that seems kind of basic, 
Um, some of you are saying, well, isn't it always international? And no, it's domestic. Um, isn't it always medical surgical? No, it could be dental. Um, there's a variety of different pieces and parts and categories, and some of the academic uh, researchers in this area have tried to come up with models, and uh, I think that's overly um, pedantic, but it's just me. Um, anyway, so uh, it is as old as civilization itself. So I had a wonderful opportunity back in 2010, great story, uh, the Egyptian government actually called me up and said, hey, we want to make Cairo a medical tourism destination, particularly in North Africa, because there's not a lot of good health care in North Africa. If anybody's been Tunisia, um, uh, Libya, um, the Algeria, most of the health care is not terrific. Cairo actually has some pretty good health care. In fact, they had a um, photon um, uh, therapy center in Cairo and some other things that were, were not found uh, very well or in, in good repair anywhere else in that region. So I went to Cairo, and this was literally about two to three months before the Arab Spring. So it was an amazing time. I didn't know it because I was there with my family at, in Cairo uh, and the Egyptian government, uh, what they said, we're, we're going to money light uh, to do this, so we'll bring you here, but we can't really pay you, so instead we're going to send you on a Nile cruise. And I was like, sold, right? And I was like, yes, bucket list, right? And so so I got to do a Nile cruise, which is amazing. We went all the way down to Anchuan and came back up the Nile River. It was amazing. So I, I don't necessarily think I would go back right now. I'd probably we wait until it's a little bit more stable, um, but um, it was fantastic at the time we went, and it was beautiful. So on the way up the Nile River, we stopped in a temple, and up on the temple wall, the tour guide was telling, showing us the formulary. It was basically the the herbal, um, an herbal remedy that was uh, done at that particular temple, and at that time, all the known world would come into Egypt. Uh, because they were known for having some of the best physicians in the world at that particular time, and they would get treatments in Egypt. Did you guys know that? So that's uh, several thousand years BC. Later, during Roman times, the, uh, the Romans would go into what's now known as Turkey and now uh, known as Switzerland uh, for thermal uh, therapies. In fact, when I was in, I forgot, somewhere in, I think it was northern Italy, but I apologize, I don't remember where now stayed at a uh, thermal spa there, and they have the thermal mud baths. Uh, so since I'm in Europe, some of you done the thermal mud baths? Anybody? Oh, come on, really? Live a little. Come on, guys. All right, so here's the story. So the Romans would go up and they would uh, fight with the Gauls, who were these really um, mean Germanic tribes. You guys are probably familiar with that history in, in Europe. And uh, they would get beat up uh, quite often. So they would come back through northern Italy um, with their wounds and their nicks and their cuts. And oftentimes the, the horses that they were riding on would have substantial injuries. So what they would do is make a poultice or a patch with the mud, and sometimes they would use the thermal mud that were particularly in Italy uh, around the volcanic areas. Well, it turns out the thermal mud, because of whatever the chemical properties are, the Roman soldiers um, not necessarily keeping good chemical, uh, excuse me, medical records, so it wasn't really evidence-based medicine, but it was based on their observation that the, the patches, the poultice that came from the mud, from the thermal volcanic areas did had a better healing um, efficacy. And so therefore, uh, that is, you ready for this? That's the basis of thermal baths and mud baths today. Did you guys know that? Yeah, that you're doing it because it worked on horses. <laughs> Seriously. But anyway, it's pretty fascinating. So um, the many uh, subcategories, um, the um, there are everything, we're going to talk a little bit about deaf tourism, there's dental tourism, there's surrogacy tourism, there's every type of healthcare and or healthcare aligned types of activities under this medical tourism trend. We're going to talk about some of those today. So please uh, excuse me if I kind of group those all under medical tourism and to some extent retirement tourism, but we'll talk about that. All right, it's driven by technology. So this is a part of the interactive 
portion. And uh, I need you guys to try to be adults, okay? So please promise me you'll try to be adults, right? So in the United States, uh, Pew Research did some great research and they found out what people use the, the internet for, okay? So again, keep it PG here, all right? So what is the number one use of the internet? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like a 20 year old undergraduate class. No, no, it's not that. Yes, not the number one use. What is the number one use of the internet? Google. No, no. Gosh, how do you guys not know? We just talked about it. What, the, what are these fine people uh, needing to receive? Did you hear that? Email. Oh, email. Ah, very good. Email is the killer app of the internet. If you did not know that, shame on you. And internet is, is primarily a, a email based, or email is the most primary thing that is used on the internet. Email is the primary use, it's the thing that you do the most often. Hopefully. Was <laughs> answering that, you're obviously, you probably need to get your priorities straight. Anyways, uh, so email is number one, according to Pew Research for Americans. What's number two, use of the internet? <laughs> <laughs> no. The answer is no. It's still no. Oh, you email guys really. Google search. Oh, Google, search. Oh, Google search is no. Sorry? Commerce. E-commerce, no. You said cameras. Medical advice. Medical advice, no. Close up. Social media. What are you guys all over 40? Come on. What the hell? All right, yeah, social media, right? Young people? Help me out, right? Yeah. Snapchat. Do you know that there's estimates? Uh, there was a, a research study from Baylor just a couple years ago that said that uh, female college students are on their phones 10 hours a day. Um, there's now an estimate out there that says that you're ready for this. This is scary stuff. The college students in general are on an electronic device. That means watching Netflix or on their phone or doing Snapchat or playing candy, candy Crush Soda, whatever the new one is that came out. Uh, 19 hours a day, 18, 19 hours a day. That's insane. So, anyways, so that's my particular thought. Anyway, so the number two reason is uh, social media, what most people do on the internet nowadays, Americans. Number three is? No. <laughs> this gentleman over here. This, uh, Sure. Medical advice, looking on healthcare. Health care is ubiquitous to the human condition. So the first thing you're going to do if your mom calls you and says, hey, listen, I got a lump somewhere, you're going to... Google. Very good. You're going to Google it, right? You're not going to get look on porn. That would be gross. <laughs> okay, please, stop. All right. Anyways, so yes, you will Google the information. And you're ready for this. Cell phones. Ready for this? This is fascinating. And uh, uh, did you know that the, uh, the most common way people access uh, Facebook, for example, in the United States is through phone. their phones? Yeah, so it turns out if you use a cell phone, um, when you happen to hear that your mother is, is ill, for example, you are more likely than you would even in front of a laptop or desktop. So cell phones actually uh, accelerate somehow the use of um, searching for health care. That's crazy. So three, three, number three is healthcare. I'm not going to go past that one though. All right. All right. So health consumerism is continuing to increase. I got a whole bunch of stuff I'm going to show you about that. But there's so many things going on. I'll, I'll tease you with one. Did, did you know that like seven years ago that nobody except for really strange people drank coconut water in the United States, right? It wasn't it like seven years ago? Like, you never heard of coconut water, right? You didn't go into the store and see coconut water there. It's like a major uh, area of, um, of battle between Pepsi and Coke right now. They're, they're seeking market share for things like coconut water. Coconut water went from like 0% market share to a percentage point or so. It was really became a big issue. And a lot of it was driven because of the uh, supposed health benefits, which now some uh, sometimes... Um, that some people suggested are not uh, actually good health benefits for coconut water. Anyways, uh, so there's uh, the estimates about medical tourism, the, the size of the industry, all out there. So don't take any of this with a 
um, with too much uh, validity. Um, medical tourism, some people are suggesting, is uh, 40 to 60 billion worldwide. Wellness tourism, um, a report that's done by SRI, which is a group of Stanford researchers that have sold out, and they, they do research for money now. Um, yeah, they've uh, estimated for the uh, wellness travel industry that's close to 3.7 trillion. But if you look at their methodology, they threw everything in there, right? It was just, they was like, hey, kitchen sink, let's put that in there, right? So it, it's, it, it's any time you show up at a hotel that has like a spa, supposedly you're engaging in wellness travel. Yeah. So but anyways, uh, they, they have, it's big, but um, it's probably not that big. All right, so let me give you some examples of consumerism, as I mentioned before. Um, PX is uh, all the rage right now in healthcare and healthcare administration. If you haven't heard of that, that's okay. It's kind of a trendy thing for patient experience. And all the hospitals are now saying, we not only got to keep them alive, but we actually have to keep them happy. And also their family members. And so that's been a big issue that they've been focusing on for several years now. Do you know there's rating sites for doctors and hospitals? Yeah, did you know like you can get on Angie's list and like dish your dentist? And there was actually, there was a funny case. Did you see that about the uh, dentist that uh, ended up suing because uh, he had a, on his form that he had a, um, oh gosh, I forgot the actual legal term, but it was an anti-dis me on the internet uh, clause. And that actually supposedly held up in contract law, but uh, there was a whole thing about, uh, you know, it's not necessarily free speech if the dentist says, hey, you can't do that, and there's penalties if you do that. So it's pretty fascinating. You should look that up on the internet um, when you're not looking up. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the rating sites are becoming big. Forums and blogs are huge in healthcare. You'd be surprised, uh, particularly around uh, spe specialty issues, women health issues. Um, so I had a graduate student that had gotten a hip replacement, and he actually selected his physician that he was going to do a hip replacement. He was um, he was a wounded uh, wounded warrior, and he could have gone through VA, and he decided not to. He had some options to go outside of the system, and so he went to a place called. Surface hippie, hippie like you know people with long hairs that smoke a lot of weed. Um, and the what he did was he went to surfacehippie.com, which is a, a whole board, a blog about people that are getting um, hip replacements or hip resurfacing. And people talk about the physicians and the hospitals, and they give ratings and suggest. It's incredible stuff. Anyway, so uh, he went to he went to that site, and that's how he found his physician. It's pretty fascinating. Alternative medicine is growing uh, by leaps and bounds. It's amazing uh, what's happening in that area. Um, even uh, there's some estimates out there in terms of hospital usage in places like the United States, which tends to be a little conservative and doesn't tend to integrate the, the whole wellness and or alternative into uh, what they call traditional Western medicine, but you're seeing it more and more. And um, the, there was a great uh, presentation I went to one time by, it was like um, up in the, uh, one of the hospitals in New York, like Presbyterian. And they said, do you know what pulls in the, the patients from out of our zip code? We have one marketing thing that we can do that brings in people. Any guesses? Not porn. It wasn't porn. <laughs> no, that's not porn. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to quit any time now. You guys are going to have to do this presentation on your own. So. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, are you ready for this? Free, it was free yoga. They got a yoga instructor, yoga mats, uh, got a room. They could bring women, women make about 80% of all the healthcare decisions in the United States, get women in there. They would interact with the yoga instructor at the hospital. They could see the hospital. They go, that's cool, I got free yoga at the hospital. I will bring my boyfriend, brother, son, whatever, back to the hospital. It turned out to be one of the, the best marketing gimmicks they ever had was free yoga. Um, the food, beverages, nutrition. I mean, I, we talked about coconut water, gluten-free anybody, right? Organic, non-GMO. The, the amount of uh, health and nutrition trends that are uh, going into food is increasing. There's even like the um, so Coke or Pepsi was bringing back one of their clear products. The reason is, you ready for this? People go, oh, it's clear. It has less particulates in it, so therefore it's healthier, right? 
really, that's what they're, they, they're stooping to everything. I mean, and some of them are probably valid, like the stevia and stuff like that. Have you seen the Coke Life, the little green cans that have the stevia rather than the uh, corn syrup? Yeah, it's amazing. So uh, this, uh, this whole um, nutrition, health, wellness thing has continued going on. Google searches, one in 20 of all Google searches everywhere in the world is health related. The majority, oh, so hospital marketing, we talked a little bit about that. Hospital marketing is having to, particularly in medical tourism and competitive private market areas, is having to, to get really hardcore. I mean, they are having to actually develop marketing efforts, whereas before they were like, we build it and we sit here and they come. And that's all they had to do. But now they're actually having to compete in a, in a marketplace of ideas. And it's, it's real fascinating. There's some great campaigns out there. Um, that I, th uh, I think it's the Cleveland Clinic one. Got a, a big award a couple years back. Groupon, 60%, over 60% of Groupon, Groupon, uh, coupons? I say, are they coupons? I guess like that. Right. You guys use them in, in Europe that much? Groupon, a little bit? Yeah, it's probably okay. Sixty over sixty percent of them healthcare related or wellness related. You know that, right? Look at them. Just look, and you're going like, oh, health, 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 wellness, health, wealth. It's it's amazing. Uh, spas are becoming different than they ever were before. Uh, we're, we're kind of, particularly in the United States, we're learning a lot from Asia and the European ideas of health and wellness, and you're seeing these med spas, which are actually employing, in some cases, physicians. It's easier to do place, in places like Turkey, because a uh, uh, medical doctor is much cheaper than it is in the United States. But you're actually having spas where you go in and there's certain types of traditional health and wellness, and then they have a doctor come up and say, hey, how, how can we help you with your asthma or your uh, dermatological uh, problems or something of that nature? Um, employers are getting much deeper and, and better in terms of employee health issues. In fact, uh, there are some employers, particularly Silicon Valley types ones, that have spas in the workplace. They want you to be healthy, well, they want you to be fit. They, they're, they're reaching out to the employees to try and keep them because if you lose that that uh, coder, really productive coder, that could be a real loss. Um, the terms of wellness and longevity are really hot now. Um, so longevity, particularly among the aging population, it's estimated. Uh, by the way, if you like to date younger people, the world is going to suck for you uh, here real soon. It's estimated that here pretty soon that about uh, a third of the population, I forgot what the exact date was, be over the age of 50. So, if you like cougars, you're in good shape, and, and, you, know, and you know where you can find pictures about cougars, yeah. <laughs> apparently. Uh, so, uh, the, anyways, longevity is a big thing right now because as the world is aging, in fact, it's going to be really bad for um, some of the, uh, the populations of the world. Places like Indonesia, um, I think it was The Economist said they're going to get, this is really just an amazing statement, you ready for this? They're going to get old before they get rich. In other words, what they're going to do is they're going to have an aging population and all the problems um, and cost associated with that before they actually develop infrastructure and have the money to help take care of those. And so uh, there's places that are going to be in dear, deep, deep problems. Uh, um, super, super health is a term that came up a few years ago. I haven't been following the area as much, but the, the idea was that people, particularly older people, are saying, going up to physicians saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to play tennis again, but I don't just want to play tennis like I did in my 20s. I sucked. I want to play tennis like I did or, or would if I was Boris Becker in the day. Uh, so that was a, a reach back if you showing my age a little bit, if you know who Boris Packard is. Uh, but anyways, uh, so they're actually they're looking to find ways, uh, particularly through um, various different types of medical doping and medical um, the, the, the uh, improvements to actually play sports and do things that they weren't able to do um, even when they were younger. That's pretty fascinating. And then obviously the, the convergence. What we're seeing is this massive convergence between spa, health, wellness, and you ready for this? Hotels. 
hotels um, uh, are becoming spas, which also will then incorporate physicians in many places in the world. They're all kind of coming together. So there's places like dental offices I've seen that have like a massage therapist that gives you um, a foot massage while you're in the chair getting your teeth pulled out, which I just find weird. So I just think you would kick them or something, you know, but apparently it's a thing. So anyways, it's really fascinating to see this uh, massive convergence in the health sector. And most of it's due to, to again, uh, consumer preferences. All right, most of this is going to go a little quicker now, so uh, no, we've got to pick up the pace a little bit. All right, so uh, World Bank. Uh, this was I got to meet uh, Mr. Matu himself uh, at the World Bank in Washington a bunch of years back. Uh, pretty fascinating study. So early in this uh, medical tourism uh, research, um, he had come up with this paper, he and a uh, co-author, that said that if the, in the United States, if they just started outsourcing um, one in ten patients that would come to through the American system that we could save in the United States about 1.4 billion dollars. <laughs> Crazy, right? One in ten people just have to leave the country and save 1.4 billion. Um, the many studies have been out there that show that it's not for everybody. Um, this was a study that was specific um, to Europe that showed, uh, well actually I should say it's Europe, it's an international study, not just an American study, uh, it showed that approximately one in five people would go out of the country if they were offered cheaper care that was at a, a similar uh, quality level. Um, Gallup, however, had did this really great study uh, back in the day uh, again, about eight years ago in uh, 11 Asian countries. And what they found was fascinating. They found that about 20% of the population within most Asian countries, think India, think China, think uh, Vietnam, places like that, would actually travel within country to get better health care. Uh, that's particularly true if you know anything about, for example, Western China, where the health care is, is from what I've heard, horrible. They travel to the East Coast, to the bigger cities, in order to get access to better care. All right, so number one reason in, the, in Europe uh, for traveling appears to be uh, non-availability of medical service. In other words, legal arbitrage. That's a term that um, Glenn Cohen from Harvard Law School came up with, which I love, um, saying that uh, people will travel because they don't have access to something they want, uh, something that uh, Dr. Root's been fighting for in terms of pharmaceuticals, for example. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, arbitrage that goes on in the, in the pharmaceutical market, people going to other countries to be able to get access to oncology drugs that are not available in their country, for example. Um, and by the way, we were talking about that at dinner, lunch, something like that, uh, North Dallas 40, uh, North Dallas Buyers Club, sorry, gosh, on that wrong movie, North, uh, North Dallas, North Texas, North Dallas, Dallas Buyers, Buyers Club. Club. Buyers. Buyers. Club. Yeah, with um, Matthew McConaughey, also a Texas legend. Um, the uh, Have you met him since you're up there in Austin? No. At all? Okay. So, all right. Anyway, so uh, it's uh, you should check it out. It's about uh, the search for HIV drugs um, that were illegal in the United States or not readily available in the end of the day. So, uh, better quality is the typically second uh, in the EU, and then after that, top specialist performing the treatment. Uh, then fourth was urgent, and then last was cost savings. Really, cost savings was the uh, not the most important feature for Europeans. All right, so I'm going to go quickly through some of these stories. I apologize if the pace is a little quick, but I wanted to go through it. But these are fun. You ready? So here we go. These are some of the stories I've collected over the years, and I assembled them just for you guys. And it's going to be now I, again. Some of these might make you angry. Some of these may make you sad. But these are stories of free market um, approaches to healthcare. Uh, patients getting sometimes what they want, sometimes what they didn't want um, from a free market. All right. So let's talk about it. So um, anybody heard of the uh, Brittany uh, Maynard uh, case? I think uh, Mary and I talked about this once before. Uh, she was um, a, a woman that lived in California who found out that she had a some type of cancer. I apologize, I don't remember what type now, but it was it was uh, diagnosed as being terminal. She was late stage, um, so she decided she wanted to die with dignity. And uh, in the United States, there was only how many? How Mary? One state, Oregon, or two? Two. Kyle, two. Kyle knows. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, where are you? There you go. Do you know the two states? Uh, Oregon, Washington. It's also just recently been legalized in Hawaii and by court decision in Montana. And California is fighting it. They had passed it through the legislature, but something was happening with that. And that but that's real recent. So um, anyway, so Brittany moved to or Oregon where she was able to get residency uh, fairly quickly so she could get access to patient-assisted suicide. And uh, so that's where she died in Oregon, uh, of, of her own volition. So she actually traveled to another state within the United States so she could get access mm -hmm. to the care that she wanted to have access to, which was, in her case was Dr. Assisted Suicide. Her husband is w one of the advocates of, I think it's called Brittany's Law, and Brittany's Law is, is they're trying to bring it to other states to make it so you can get access to it. I've been the, to this place. In fact, somewhere in that picture, if you see a really buff, good-looking guy, that's actually me. Um, yeah, so I've been to this place. This is in Budapest. Um, you're probably very aware here in Poland, uh, many of you Europeans, of uh, the Budapest and the uh, spa and wellness uh, trend. There's some estimates out there. This is crazy. I find these absolutely freaking crazy. That um, I think it was like 5 to 7% of uh, Jordan's GDP is based on um, uh, bailing with therapy and spa and thermal um, things, the Dead Sea. Can you imagine that? About five to seven percent of the total GDP of a country is based on medical tourism. That's just crazy. But there, they have some numbers to back that up. All right, so this one's going to make you a little, a little feel a little weird. I apologize. You ready? All right, so baby gammy. Baby gammy is uh, the baby here. Um, an Australian couple decided that they wanted to get uh, surrogacy tourism, which is where you go to a foreign country uh, in order to um, get access to a surrogate. Surrogates obviously are, are less expensive in many foreign countries, particularly in this case Thailand, and so they were able to get a surrogate. And if you know anything about in vitro fertilization, oftentimes the physicians will implant more. more, very good, very good. More eggs, uh, more uh, you know, zygotes, gametes, help me, God. Zygotes. zygotes, thank you. I always forget the um, biology stuff. Uh, so the uh, more than you would expect because uh, oftentimes uh, some of them uh, do not uh, attach uh, correctly. Anyway, so oftentimes, as you, you probably heard in the news, uh, we've had some famous um, women, in fact, the uh, sept Tuplet or whoever it was. Optimon. Uh, Optimon. Yeah, I forgot how many she had. So that was the eight. So uh, the, the oftentimes you'll have more than you expected. Well, they had two children. One of uh, the children uh, was by, uh, by uh, don't even know how to say this, but every sense of the word normal, the other child had Down syndrome. The Australian couple showed up to the surrogate. Um, when they found out what the situation was, they were obviously under a lot of stress and perhaps their minds were racing. They took the child that did not have Down syndrome and they quickly fled the country. They left the child with Down syndrome in Thailand. Uh, the mother uh, then uh, sought uh, Australian citizenship for the child. She was given um, a, some type of citizenship as well, and the child was entitled to Australian benefits. Uh, it's a really fascinating situation. Um, this is real raw free market. Uh, I'm not going to show you all the good things because not everything that happens is always good, right? There's there's bad uh, players. There's People make bad decisions. In this case, a consumer decided to do something that um, was perhaps unethical, and uh, it's it's a real situation. <coughs> Amazing, huh? All right, anybody? You know, socialist, right? Dead socialist, Hugo Chavez, right? How did he die? Cancer. Cancer. Where was he getting treated? Cuba. Cuba, that's right. So yes, he was actually uh, traveled to Cuba. I think uh, three times during his uh, his uh, cancer treatment days. And uh, I think, as I recall, and it's been a couple of years now, uh, didn't he die in Cuba and was and brought back to Venezuela? Yeah, maybe. I think so. Maybe. Anybody? Americans. Roosevelt. Another known socialist, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? FDR? Anybody know what this is, though? It's 
This was the Southern White House. Anybody remember their history about this? So Roosevelt, uh, it, it, some of you might be aware, had a difficulty in standing. In fact, it was suggested that he actually really couldn't stand them for very long. And he believed uh, that the Warm Springs uh, rehabilitation that he did in Georgia allowed him to have the, the little strength he did. And so he had been going down there. In fact, supposedly uh, the ownership stayed in the Roosevelt family for some period of time, perhaps even still to this day, but it's a historic uh, um, ranch kind of property around the Warm Springs, natural Warm Springs. And uh, he, he would travel there during the off times of World War II in order to rehabilitate so that he was able to appear strong in front of the American people. I went there when I came out, I wanted to redistribute income. <laughs> yeah. Did you start a new entitlement program after you came back? So, uh, anyways, uh, so anybody hear about this? This is fascinating. We just had the uh, the Irish elections uh, around the, um, I apologize, what proposition number was it? It was the abortion proposition in Ireland. Did you guys see that? It's kind of big news in Ireland. All right, so uh, there was a, a group uh, in southern Ireland, uh, obviously British, British held side of an island, uh, that was, uh, the Northern Ireland has a very strict uh, Catholic um, um, policies in place or has had uh, for many years and so people on Southern Ireland would equip drones with the uh, morning after pill and allow or, <laughs> a, or some uh, version of it I'm not sure exactly what it was and they would fly it uh, by drone into Northern Ireland so that women could get access um, to a drug that was illegal in their country <laughs> and, uh, all right so I'm sorry I gotta say it. all right right by raise of hands one, I gotta get one person. What song is this? No, no. no, you have to raise your hand. You ruined it. Oh, come on, come on. Okay, so here we got. Now we have to raise our hands. <laughs> what does Gangnam mean in Korean? Raise your hands. It's a city in. Okay, somebody's got a better answer. I'm gonna give it to her. Salsa for the river. Okay, I'll give it to you since she already can get access to it. You get a, um, Mary's going to sign a book for you. So yes, it's south of the river. It's south of Seoul if you're not familiar with that. So why is this important to medical tourism? Gangnam. What's Gangnam style referred to? Very good. Way to go, doctor. Say he got he knows it, right? Gangnam is one of the main centers in the world for plastic surgery. There is uh, probably perhaps more plastic surgeons and clinics in uh, South of the River in Seoul than there is in any place else in the world. The Chinese come there um, by the the boat loans basically, and and they get uh, cosmetic surgery mostly due to the eyes. Eyes. No. And not just the eye issues, K-pop. What are you guys all, all over 40? Come on, K-pop, anybody? Yeah. Come on, young people, would you help them to explain what K-pop is? If you don't know, then you are way on the hip, okay? So I can't hang with you. Thank you, yes, okay, see so you deserve that book. Too. All right, yes, Korean pop, right? You know, like boy bands kind of, and girl bands like we have in other places. Thank you. All right, so uh, that is a, a big thing in Korea, and that leads to a lot of plastic surgery because everyone's look at K-pop. Peyton Manning flew to Germany. He was making like $25 million a year. He couldn't find a doctor in the United States that could do the procedure that he wanted, so he went to Germany. Uh, it was a. Uh, it wasn't stem cell related. I apologize. I know the the. I remember the physician's name, but I, I, I have to think of it. But it was uh, for treatment of the. Uh, do you have Tommy John or something like that? Anybody? I don't remember. Yeah. It was, sho it was shoulder, well, neck, something, yeah. and it was uh, something to help uh, to rehabilitate. He was late late in his career, so he was probably in his late thirties at that time. Um, Charlie Gard. I need to say any more. You guys know. Okay, um, British uh, child born with a very rare disease um, that was uh, could have been treated perhaps with experimental procedures in the United States and they, even the Vatican um, Church, uh, the Vatican's hospital, private hospital, offered to take him. British uh, authorities would not allow him to, and they let him die in an NHS facility. Anybody? President Buhari from Nigeria. The, 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 the country's been crying about medical tourism for many years. 
he went to London and then, for his yeah. private, uh, on his private plane to see his private doctor. Uh, made quite a stink in, in Nigeria. In fact, there's now several African nations that have, you ready for this, built into their constitution, the the phrase, the president shall never leave the country to go get health care somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually, I think there's like three nations now that have that built into their constitution. It's crazy. Anybody? Did you guys hear about oh, this? Yeah. All right, this was, this was an amazing case. Uh, also, uh, to some extent, uh, selective um, police enforcement, and we'll talk about that. Uh, anchor babies. So uh, Chinese uh, mothers, pregnant mothers, would come to the United States. They were staying in a maternity hotel uh, outside of uh, Hollywood in Los Angeles or outside of Beverly Hills, I can't remember. And uh, they would uh, have their children in the United States so they could get... Citizenship. citizenship, that's right, dual citizenship by being born in the United States. Um, so the FBI raided this maternity hotel and decided to pack these people up and send them off. What was crazy, which I love, by the way, was uh, they had activities for these pregnant women. So think a bunch of pregnant Chinese women, and they had like you know 10 or 20 of them, and they would march them into various different places to do cool stuff they can't do in China. One of which was shooting range. So can you imagine like 10 to 20 um, you know, pregnant Chinese women with AR-15s or something like that firing and firing? That's what they did. Isn't that crazy? Now, interestingly, my hospital that uh, that uh, one of the hospitals I used to work with uh, in San Antonio, Texas, our big hospital, was called Maine Methodist. And Maine Methodist had a robust trade in anchor babies from Mexico. Mexico. We never were invaded by the FBI. The FBI didn't give a damn about the fact that uh, Mexican women were coming in for, for years. I mean, it was well known. So I, I didn't know that this was really against the law, that you could, and apparently this was like conspiracy or RICO charges or something. I don't know. It's crazy. I, I never heard of it being, I, I forgot exactly what they was charged with. Uh, this uh, gentleman had a uh, weight reduction surgery and other things done in Malaysia. He, as he was starting to leave the hotel or something like that, his, uh, his stitches split and he started bleeding out all over the place and uh, he ended up having um, a uh, horrible reaction to that and ended up dying violently before he ever left uh, Malaysia, even at, despite several surgeries. And he was Australian, by the way. Uh, you guys remember this? I think it was a Super Bowl uh, commercial. Ozzy Osbourne, right? Ozzy Osbourne, who has like about two brain cells left after all the drugs and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they, they had him say, uh, it was a commercial for, um, they said, uh, what would you like to do if you go to New York? And they, they had like a commentator or somebody, or maybe his wife asked him that, and he says, I'd like to get a colonoscopy in New York. And, and they actually had a, a, a a giveaway, which was a free colonoscopy if you, when you fly to New York. So you fly to New York, you stay in a hotel, and you get a colonoscopy. I thought that was hysterical. Yeah, you can find it on YouTube. Go on YouTube and watch it. It's hysterical. You'll laugh. All right, this is a weird one. You ready for this? So um, in Iran, uh, the Khomeini had done a fatwa, if I'm saying that correctly, um, that uh, basically said that anybody that is a homosexual needs to convert um, their gender. And so Iranian physicians, surgeons, I should say, have become some of the best in the world at doing gender reassignment surgeries. <laughs> and actually, people that are interested in gender reassignment oftentimes will fly into Iran because they're some of the best in the world. I was told that first story was first told to me by a Yale uh, professor that's uh, one of the best, uh, most well known um, um, uh, fertility, uh, fertility tourism people in the world. And I didn't believe it. Uh, this is that story I think Scott was telling you about this, and I had the words a little wrong. He was actually, by the way, he was the premier of, uh, oh gosh, no, I'm forgetting it. Uh, it wasn't BC, it was. Um, Oh, oh no, it was Ontario, the little tiny one, Newfoundland, Newfoundland. He was the premier of Newfoundland, and uh, he went to a, it was actually in Florida, not in Minnesota. He went down to Florida, got a heart surgery, went back up there, press, tore him up, said, we got great hospitals here. Why didn't you stay in Canada where you can get your free health care? And he said, it's my health, it's my choice. <laughs> he wanted to go to Florida because he thought he could get better quality. 
Uh, India, they introduced several years back something called a medical tourism visa, and you can see uh, it's a special visa only for people that have uh, that are going to have medical tourism. Uh, Mexico has something similar that they were proposing, which is medical tourism police, which are people that would watch over uh, medical tourists to make sure they're safe in countries. Um, companies, uh, for example, Lowe's, Walmart, Pepsi, and Boeing have been doing bundled contracts with specific providers and actually saving money by bringing their volume to hospitals and physicians and negotiating lower rates, free market trend in healthcare. And also, uh, Korea has a medical tourism warranty where they say if you're not satisfied, you can either get your money back or potentially get uh, your services redone. Okay. Still to this day. Um, a, a physician, a oncologist, as I recall, at, at NHS in Great Britain, uh, he had, it came out as kind of a whistleblower here this last year and said that he, about one out of 20 of his cancer patients um, were undocumented, uh, people that were, had flown into the country from Africa or other places and were getting free oncology care. And he suggested, based on his estimates, that the NHS was losing about two billion pounds a year. Crazy. Mexico was rated uh, last year as the uh, number one uh, retirement haven. Uh, there's uh, approximately 800,000, almost a million um, Americans, according to a University of Texas Austin study, uh, that live in Mexico, at least on a part-time basis. <coughs> this is uh, really fascinating. This is a uh, Irish boy um, named Billy Caldwell. He actually traveled into the United States not long after it, uh, medical marijuana was made available, because it's still not available in Ireland, uh, to, take, uh, to deal with uh, really severe seizures, and it's had a, an incredible effect effect on him. And uh, it's just a, a beautiful story. He, I think it was like 30, last I, I saw, it was like 30 days he'd gone without these seizures. And he was typically having 30 seizures a day, and they were uh, extremely bad. In fact, uh, when he was born, uh, physicians had suggested that he probably would not live um, to, to the age he is now. And so his mother is just thankful as heck that he's able to access medical marijuana. All right, so real quickly, uh, let's go through this, and then I'll, I'll show you that study that I did. And again, I have to do this very quickly. So um, for libertarians, you have to understand uh, health, what health care is and health care access is, okay? Health care is not insurance. You got that? So when uh, socialists, uh, when progressives come to you and say, hey, what about people having access to health care? We're not talking about insurance. Healthcare and insurance are two completely different things, right? You don't say, when you're talking about buying a car, you're not talking about getting insurance for your car, right? Okay, yes, okay, so make sure that you call them out on it. Access to healthcare is not access to insurance. Thank you, excellent. All right, good. Healthcare is more than just cost and quality separately. It turns out we don't typically just buy things based on cost and or quality alone. We mix them together and there's this term called value. Um, Michael Porter uh, from um, Harvard's Business School, uh, the father of modern strategy, wrote a book on it. It was not well received in the healthcare industry that basically said we should focus on value, not constantly fighting about cost or or the quality, it's everything all together, wrapped into a nice bow, just like when you buy a car. Healthcare has been resistant to globalization uh, up until recently. The medical tourism, modern uh, medical tourism is helping to break down those barriers. That's going to lead to a lot more consumer choices. The best, newest, most expensive healthcare is not always Best Buy. That comes from a study that was, as I recall, University of Chicago and Harvard Medical School got together. What they found is that certain procedures, for example, da Vinci robotic surgeries, although they add a couple of percentage points to the overall efficacy of the procedure, in other words, you have a better chance to survive, but maybe it's only like two, three, five percent, but it's not worth the additional price. You get it? In other mm -hmm. words, it, 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 now, you think it's worth the additional price, but it actually isn't from a rational cost basis. If you do the business model, it's really not worth that extra. I know you want grandma to have the best possible thing, but you're spending way too much money on something that uh, is not worth the additional benefit. Uh, macro level analysis is very difficult to understand issues, so if you're looking at big, big numbers like 
the death rate in the United States. And you're not going down into specifics. If you look at, um, um, uh, gosh, what's all the numbers they always tell you? Oh, the amount of money spent on health care. Well, that doesn't matter. What, what's the outcomes associated with that money? Okay. So the losing macro level analysis, which progressives love to do, they love to throw out OECD numbers or WHO numbers or something like that uh, and say, well, our healthcare system, talking about the United States, is not as good as get into the specifics and you'll start to find out that every country has issues, problems, every country has um, things that they're good at, things that they need to work on. Uh, there's a lot of issues in healthcare. It's a complex system, just like pretty much every business system. And again, it, it's one of the most personal decisions and it really begs the idea of liberty and freedom. Give people the choice for what they want to do, how they want to do it. It's like food, okay? Some people like their steaks, medium, some of them like them rare, okay? Let people have choices in healthcare and let them pursue those choices. Get it? Mm -hmm. That if you, if you approach it any other way, it doesn't make sense. It's not logic, reasonable, or rational. All right, let's talk about uh, two cases with progressives, and I'll show you the, the very quickly the study. I'm running out of time. All right, so John Oliver, uh, very famous young people, particularly, right? John Oliver? Yes. Watch, yeah, thank you. Okay, you watch it occasionally. Uh, so he tried to make a splash. He was saying, I'm going to give away more money than Oprah ever did. So what he did is he went out and bought uh, $15 million worth of medical debt, started up a company to buy the medical debt, took him like $50 to get the license, bought $15 million worth of medical debt, uh, went out to the people on the list and said, hey, guess what, your money, uh, that uh, medical debt is written off. I'm not going to report you the credit rating. You don't have to pay it. It's done. Congratulations. And so he bragged about, hey, I gave more money than Oprah ever did, uh, which, which according to those statistics is right. Um, 9,000 people, um, uh, about, uh, he bought it for $60,000, $15 million. Okay, did he ever say, wow, this whole free market thing in healthcare really works? No. Do you get, do you get it? It does because he just wrote off $15 million worth of medical debt for $60,000. He helped people that were purchasing things that they might not have been able to afford, and he took care of it through a charitable initiative. They have to pay tax on that, by the way. He does, or they do? They, do. they still have to pay tax on yeah. the medical debt. Right, they were forgiven something they owed, so they owed pay for Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, people that got those those cars. Uh, yeah, on, on, yeah, from Oprah. Tax okay, and the horror of the horror of taxes, right? That's your life. All right, all right, ready for this one? Anybody? Anybody? Younger people, particularly? Robbie Rotten. How do you not remember this? You guys, what did you, did you sleep through the '90s? What the heck? All right, Robbie Rott was a very famous show. Uh, I forgot what the name of the show was. It was basically a show about physical fitness for kids. Um, I'm sorry? Yes, that was it. Yes, thank you. Good, excellent. All right, so um, he got a GoFundMe page to help with his uh, oncology, and I don't remember what type of oncology, oncology treatments. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's beautiful. I love GoFundMe. So I think that's a beautiful way for people to give to other people to pay for health care. Ready for this? He lives in? Britain. Iceland. Everything's paid for. It's free. I don't get it. <laughs> what so what's he doing with the 120? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't care. But, but, but that's the thing. The progressives are like, oh, that's beautiful. We're helping to pay for itself. No, you're not helping to pay for itself. Okay. But who cares? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up. All right, uh, so two uh, quick uh, cartoons, and then we'll go to the Polish uh, data, and then I'll be out of here. And I, I'm sorry about that. David, you already run out of time. So. I did? Okay, I'll make it very, very, very quick. All right, so uh, this is Alfie Evans. This shows the horrors of socialized medicine. These are British police making sure that Alfie Evans stays in the hospital and dies. Baby Alfie Evans, similar to Charlie Gard. That's socialized medicine for you. This is a cartoon from Canada that shows uh, that uh, what happens uh, in Canon and Canadian uh, queues where people oftentimes die before they get treatment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, what I did, I'll just run to the end, is looked at uh, Polish and Eastern European healthcare. What I found was that uh, Poles in general uh, tend to spend 
less of their government dollars on health care, meaning that there's a more robust private sector than it seems that perhaps even there is in the U.S. I found that fascinating. And uh, a little bit more than what they spend in Korea, which has a great health care system. It seems there's some great uh, health care companies which are driving what seems to be an increase in medical tourism that you've heard about here in Poland. Um, found a great article that had suggested that uh, what has happened in many of the Eastern Bloc Soviet satellite countries is there was a widespread rejection of the Soviet model of universal free access to basic health. So what they decided to do is pull up data that the, U, uh, that the EU collects on uh, imports and exports of health services and uh, looked uh, positives are good. In other words, if you have positive numbers, it means that you're getting more people to come into your country, negative is bad, meaning you're getting more people that are leaving your country. So what I did was looked at the, the former Soviet bloc eastern countries, and what I found was fascinating is that they were positive, in other words, uh, between the uh, debits and credits, they were actually getting a positive return on medical tourism. They were getting more people coming in, spending money in their country, whereas the Western European countries in general were losing money. In other words, more British, more Germans, more French, more Spanish, more Nordic uh, country, people from those countries are coming into the Eastern Bloc country. This, uh, this has never been done before, this split like this. I hadn't seen this in the literature, and I didn't know what to expect, and I was pretty surprised by it. Uh, there's some holes in the data, but uh, overall it's pretty fascinating, and looks like that Poland um, and other Eastern countries are, are more, um, they're spending more time and effort on medical tourism and rejecting socialized medicine. And that, I apologize, I ran out of time, so I better finish up. Thank you.